Malala Yousafzai. She's a high school student. She's a very empowered person uh, who is interested not only in developing her skills, but in using them to improve the world. And have next slide. Now, like Malala, Malala has been born 50 years ago. She probably will not be a high school student. She has experienced remarkable mobility uh, in, in opportunity from the opportunities her parents and her grandparents have. Most children around the world have seen opportunities. You have here boys, 90% 90, 90 of whom are enrolled in primary school, and you have girls, uh, slightly less, but about 90% of them are enrolled in primary school, and three quarters of them will finish primary school. This is for the world. And then about 62% of the boys are enrolled in secondary school, and about 60% of the girls are enrolled in secondary school. These figures are remarkable because they have they represent the progress that took place over the last six decades, six to seven decades. Next slide, please. But of course, the number of children around the world, 57 million children around the world, do not have those opportunities to be in school. And that's about 57,000 times the number of people left in this room, or almost 3,000 times the number of students at Harvard who are not in school, or 60 times the total number of students in public and private schools in Massachusetts, or 4% more than the total number of students in elementary and secondary school in the United States who are not, who do not have the opportunity to go to school. Next slide. Now, why are Malala, this is Harold Heck, by the way. This picture should have shown up. Harold is a senior in high school uh, in Long Island. He was just admitted to the 13 high schools. Uh, he is an immigrant uh, from Nigeria, as are his parents. And he too experienced remarkable uh, expansion in education opportunity. Harold uh, aspires to be a neurosurgeon, and among the many educational experiences that empowered him, empowered him uh, are not only research internships that he did while a high school student, but also doing the model UN, something maybe many of you have done. Next slide, please. So, why are they in school? They are in school because these men. 400 years ago, had the presence of mind in the wake of some people burning in his house, and within his house, his wife and his two kids. And they burned him because they disagreed with his religious beliefs. He asked himself, why do we do these things to one another? And he said, we do that because, because we don't have a better way to work out our differences. And we should educate everybody so we could have peace in the world. The name of this man is Amos, uh, John Amos Khomeini. And he's considered the father of public education, of the idea that everyone should be educated. Now, 400 years ago, we didn't have means to turn this idea into execution. It would take another 200 years for that to happen in some nations in Europe. But for most of the world, it would take this woman, Eleanor Roosevelt, and a number of people working with her drafting what is one of the most remarkable designs of human imagination, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. One of the articles in which states that education is a basic human right. As a result of including education in that little document, a global movement began 65 years ago that changed the face of the earth. Because 65 years ago, most people around the world did not have the opportunity to set foot in a school, and today they do. 90% were in primary school, three quarters of them finish primary, 60% were in secondary school. Next slide. And so, this global education movement includes a legal or quasi-legal movement. It includes the Declaration of Human Rights, it includes the Convention on the Rights of Children, the creation of a set of institutions such as the UN, UNESCO, UNICEF, a number of convenings where people persuade and advocate for changes that will bring everybody to school, and a number of mechanisms to transfer experiences and ideas about what works. Next slide, please. Now, this movement has and remains largely focused on three issues. Access to school, for the 57 million who are still not in school. Inequality, in terms of the groups of kids who do not have access to school within and between nations. And opportunity to learn basic skills. Opportunity to learn how to read mathematics in some context science. Those things are very, very important. I want to argue today that we should be building on that movement to produce a shift in thinking so that education really empowers the kids to invent the future. Next slide. 
And so I think there is a big difference between leading to promote access to school or to promote schools to do better that which they are intending to do, or even leading for equity. There is a difference between those three forms of leadership and leading for relevance. What do I mean for relevance? I mean equipping students with the skills they will need to function in the world in which they live and will live. Next slide. And so, if you think some of the previous speakers have talked about some of the big challenges that we face, the challenge of coexistence, of being able to see religious differences and other differences as a source of strength, as a source of creativity, to embrace it and not to hunker down or fear it to the point that we do the same things that those who stand to make the house on fire be for centuries ago. The challenge of eliminating poverty and reducing the exclusion, the social exclusion and inequality that it creates. The challenge of making sure that we engage with the environment in a way that there is an earth that we can pass down to our children and grandchildren. Next slide. Now for the last 20, 25 years, a number of people in a range of quite independent movements have been dealing with the question of what are the skills that people should have in the 21st century? In this country, that began in 1990 when the Department of Labor commissioned a study, this country report, that in the wake of growing technology was going to transform work and civic participation as what should schools teach so that our kids are ready for the jobs of the future and for the forms of political engagement of the future. For most of the world, UNESCO in the mid-1990s asked former chairman of the European Committee, Jacques Lourdes, to organize a series of global consultations on what kind of learning would be necessary for the 21st century. And that movement produced this report, Learning the Treasure Within, which is a wonderful blueprint outline for the skills that children will need in the 21st century, but that remains a vision, an aspirational vision. Uh, we have not, by and large, the global education movement has not executed that mission. Next slide. The Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development in the 1990s did something very similar around the world in this country as a result of the work of the SCAT report. An unlikely coalition of partners, our largest teacher union, the NEA, um, the federal administration, and the four major technology companies began an advocacy coalition, a partnership for 21st century skills, that set out to advocate and try to persuade states that we should be thinking about the skills that children will need in the 21st century. In the state of Massachusetts, when our uh, recently uh, outgoing governor, Paul Patrick, took office, he passed the Secretary of Education with looking into the question of uh, skills of the 21st century. And the Secretary put together a task force that produced a beautiful blueprint that talks about the skills that Massachusetts educational institutions should help all of our high school graduates graduate with. It's a wonderful blueprint, but as with the Lorsch report, the only problem with it is that very few people have read the document, including people in senior positions uh, in the education department. And by and large, we did not translate that vision into a strategy or implementation plan. Next slide, please. So when I think about skills for the 21st century, these are summarized, and this is drawing from a synthesis report of the National Research Council on three big blocks. Cognitive skills, the capacity to work with others and get things done with them, and self-knowledge. Next slide. I'll go very quickly over them, simply to say that we don't need to discover what these skills are. What we need to do is figure out how do we create opportunity at scale for children to gain those skills. The first building block includes certainly knowledge, the capacity to process that knowledge to solve problems, and innovation and creativity. Some of the previous speakers have addressed those skills. Next slide. So processing includes things like critical thinking, problem solving, analysis, logical reasoning, interpretation, decision making, executive function. Knowledge includes things like knowledge of the disciplines. Next slide, please. Literacy, um, active listening skills, ability to use evidence and assess biases and information, digital literacy. Next slide. Creativity includes capacity to think outside the box, to innovate, and to create. Next slide, please. Capacity to work with others includes collaborative group skills and leadership. Next slide, please. Collaborative group, group skills include things like communication, collaboration, teamwork, cooperation, coordination, service orientation, capacity to negotiate conflicts without having to burn the house down of a person we disagree with. 
Leadership includes the capacity to influence others, to take responsibility, to communicate assertively, to tell a story of self. Next one. And finally, the capacity to govern oneself includes at least three building blocks, a certain open, openness of mind, work ethic, and self-advocacy. Next, next slide. Intellectual openness includes things like flexibility, adaptability, personal and social responsibility, intercultural competency, and so on. Work ethic includes, next slide, things like initiative, self-correction, read, capacity to set goals, to learn from experience. Next slide. Self-efficacy includes things like the capacity to regulate oneself and taking care of physical and mental health. Next slide, please. So the question is, for all these skills, there are programs that do them. And those programs include Education in the Arts, Model UN, Sports, um, United World Colleges. There are many examples in these countries and others that successfully teach those skills to young people. What we lack are examples of how we do that for all the children. So the paradox that we, that we need to resolve is the fact that in 65 years, this global education movement has given everyone the opportunity to be educated. But perhaps there are many skills that empower them, that allow them to do what Carol Peck and Malala, your society, can obviously do, which is to take responsibility for their lives and to improve the world in which they live. So how do we do that? Next slide. This is the focus of, we have the opportunity in this very room, um, Secretary General of the UN announced as his priorities for the post MDG educational goals, three goals. Access is an old goal, quality is an old goal, and the development of global citizenship. In this concept, which has everybody going around in circles in the US trying to figure out what does that mean, is an opportunity to seize that concept and say that is what education for environment means. Next slide. Um, I'm leading a research project that is trying to make a contribution to this window of opportunity in front of us. So the lab, the Harvard Global Education Initiative. Our goal is to sequence the DNA of how we do 21st century skill at scale. And what we're doing is very simple. It's built on the premise that every problem in the world has been solved by someone somewhere. What we need to do is to study that and figure out the conditions under which it can be replicated. So we're trying to figure out how is the national systems define the skills that young people need for the 21st century. We're trying to code that and figure out what are the mechanisms and processes that have helped build the capacity to do that. And then we're trying to share this knowledge with as many institutions as we possibly can fast so that we can seize this opportunity. We're working at the moment in six countries, the United States, Mexico, Chile, Singapore, India, and China. And the very first thing we have done, which is resulted in a book that will be published at the end of this year, is to examine national standards and curriculum and to answer the question, what is the intended focus of the curriculum in these places? To what extent does it reflect the 21st century skills that I just shared with you a moment ago? And we find very big differences. We find that the small nation state of Singapore, for example, does in my assessment have the most comprehensive views of trying to provide a music education to children in this life. And how do they do it? Let's summarize here. I don't think that this model is a better blueprint than the one that was produced by the task force in Massachusetts that produced a vision for the 21st century. But in Massachusetts, very few people have, produced, have read that report, and some of the members of that commission don't remember what it says. In Singapore, everybody knows this little diagram. And this diagram synthesizes, and by everybody, I mean teachers, school principals, people who, who prepare teachers, people who decide curriculum, policy makers. It's a diagram that synthesizes to them, for the Singaporean people, what is the vision of what a good education is. At the core, our core values are defined identically. Around them, you have competencies that include self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, capacity to manage relationships, and responsible decision-making. And then in the outside core, you have core interests. Civic interests, global awareness, cross-cultural skills, critical and inventive thinking, communication, collaboration, and information skills. And outside that, you have the, what they, they believe are the pillars of the citizen they want to educate. An active contributor, a self-selected leader, a confident person, a concerned citizen. Next slide. You are going to that. Once you have clarity on what the outcome is, you can then map backwards and say, how do you compare teachers and school principals to teach in a way that produces that? And this is a vision which is nothing as powerful as 
having a clear idea of what the outcome is and using that to guide efforts to prepare teachers and school principals. I don't have the time to share some of what they do. Next slide. I was recently in Dubai attending one of the things a conference that recognized exemplary teachers. For the last year, many countries around the world participated in this process to identify good teachers. These were the 10 finalists. Three of them are teachers in the United States. Nancy Agua is a winner, which is in Maine. Naomi Lane is a teacher of sustainability and science in Springfield. And Stephen Reitz is a teacher in the Bronx, in the poorest US congressional district in America. These are teachers who are trying to equip the students with the skills they need to not only respond to their circumstances, but to embrace them into a constructive future. I think they remind us that we do have good practice in every country, even in countries who are not doing that at scale. And we have a great opportunity in identifying these outliers and in trying to decode the process that explain why they can do what they do, to then bring them over to a larger movement so that we can build on the good work of these people, on the ideas of Comenius, the work of Eleanor Roosevelt and those that with her build the UN system to educate all children. Next slide. So that we can actually teach all children with purpose. Thank you.